we've been on this uh, discussion. Oh, God bless you for being here. God bless you for being here. Uh, we welcome you to this place of worship and uh, just a uh, family chapter. So, you know, not much is uh, talked about heaven. We begin this series uh, about heaven and, and what that really means. In fact, I said several weeks ago as we started this series that I'm really concerned about how it uh, seems to be that most of, of American Christians, American churches, are really focused in the blessings of now. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of this generation that we like it, we like it right now. We put on the altar of, of the future and, and uh, of self-gratification. So we want things right now. We want to be gratified now. So to talk about heaven and those things is not really a big subject in the American church anymore. And so, and, and to be honest with you, I've never preached a series on heaven. So, so I'm, I'm guilty of that also. And so as, as I began to, to prepare for this, and to look at this, I, I, I really grown to really love what we've been talking about, and, and it's really changed my attitude about some things and the way that I hang on to things, the way that I view this earth today. And I hope it has for you too. So, so we're going to continue that. And I know maybe some of you just uh, you're kind of right in the middle of this thing, and and uh, some of you commented, you know, there's a there's a web page. It's a whatever that's called, Early Christian Church dot com. Yeah, email, whatever. <laughs> Well, you can get on there and you can kind of get up there and do some of these things if you want to. It's good sleeping material. Anyway, sure, but we're talking about that today because, uh, because I, I want to make sure that we're clear. As your, as your pastor and as, as a teacher of the gospel, I want you to be prepared when you stand before God in these days and you're just not overwhelmed by heaven. You're not going to be like John who fainted when he gets to heaven that, that I prepared you to know and say, well, my preacher told me it was going to be this way and I'm excited to be here. Amen? Amen. Because you don't, want to fall, you don't want to fall to heaven and faint because you don't want to miss anything about heaven. Amen. It's going to be great. So that's why we talked this series. Uh, several Sundays ago, a couple Sundays ago, we talked about the top of this is what you see there is eternity, what happens after death. And we talked about death. And we talked about that the, uh, the Bible, Scripture tells us about death. In the Old Testament, New Testament, the kind of the definition, working definition that we go with is that death means separation. Separation from this life, separation from this earth, and separation. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, about the second death that's uh, in, in Revelation chapter 20. But anyway, at this point, you know, uh, we talked about death. Death is a point in time. Every one of us, if the Lord tarries, you know, are, are going to die. We don't really like to talk about that very much, but to get a grasp on heaven, we've got to know that one of these days, this, this earth, this life that we know it, is going to end. I know we don't talk about it, we kind of obscure ourselves from that, and we've got scar tissue from having to deal with that, and we, we don't really like to talk about it. We like to talk about the blessings of now, and not perhaps the blessings of the future. And so we talked about death, we talked about that, that Christ, through Christ, we won the victory over death. Amen? The sting of death has been removed through Jesus. Christ is dead, his burial, and what? His resurrection. He shows us that we want that. And then we talked about in the death that there are two destinations of death. There's one place called hell, and we're going to get to that. And the other place is called heaven, and that's where we are right now. Talking about this other destination that the Bible clearly describes is hell and also heaven. Now I want to read our goal here. We, we've kind of established a goal throughout this series. I want us to be really clear about this. Because here's what happens a lot of times. We can get a lot of information about heaven and, and just walk away. Well, it's a place out there. And God lives out there. And, and, and those who, who died in Christ and those who died in the faith, of the, even the Old Testament of, of faith in God, they're there now. We know that there's a great host up there. We talked about that last time. We got that, but, but that's about it for that thing, about heaven. And so I clearly want us to know, how do we deal with this thing? Rather than telling a bunch of information... How do we live this thing out? Okay, you with me? Okay. So here's our goal. Our goal with God's grace. In other words, we need God's grace in this because it's contrary for us to think about the future in heaven because none of us have experienced that. There may be bits of heaven we've experienced in our lives, spiritual things, but, but the true essence of what we've been talking about, we've not experienced that. So there's a, there's a fear of the unknown. We all have that. We all have to admit that and get over that. But notice with God's grace... We're able to do this, okay? So with God's grace, we can learn to live in light of heaven. And that hope, talking about the hope of heaven, 
And that hope of heaven will stir our hearts, change our lives, and loosen our tagged grip that we have on the things of this earth. I know somebody said, I think they said, the preacher said that, did yeah. Okay, that's, that's the lesser word that I really wanted to say, okay? And so, so we just lessen this grip that we have on the things of this earth that we'll just kind of let go and just kind of loosen up a little bit and live in the reality that one of these days, those who are in Christ, we're going to experience this wonderful thing called heaven. Now here's a question for you. Maybe y'all read or kind of skimmed it like myself. Pilgrim's Ponderance. How many of y'all have kind of done that? Okay. Remember, some of y'all went to college, it was required to read it. Remember that? Y'all didn't do that? Just kind of skipped out of that? Y'all was off the car. Love you. Paul Bunyan, in this, in this Pilgrim's Progress, he, he gives us uh, it's a classic dialogue of travelers, of pilgrims. And it's a classic dialogue of the, of the Christian experience, the Christian movement, if you would, the Christian life. And, and in this dialogue, there's a focal point in the book where he talks about these two travelers, these two pilgrims. And they're headed to this uh, celestial city, which is really by Paul. But he's really talking about heaven. He's talking about the movement of a Christian life. And the des final destination is heaven. He talks about heaven as this celestial city. And in these, two, these two, two pilgrims, these two travelers, as they're moving toward that destination of heaven, one of the travelers asked the other this question. He said this, When do you find yourself, friend? In the most wholesome and most vigorous spiritual state. In other words, his question is this. He's asking this person as they're traveling along to this celestial city, this destination of life, the, the thing that happens after death, the question is this. When in this life right now do you find yourself growing spiritually? That you're spiritually on fire, that you're spiritually in life, that, that God is showing you these things way beyond what you've ever experienced. When are those moments? And here's his answer. You ready? The answer is this. When I think of the place to which I'm going. When I think of the place to which I'm going. I, I think, let me just kind of read what I wrote here about this. I think this simple point in this dialogue, John Bunyan expresses and emphasizes this awesome truth of, of an active, enlightened spiritual life that's accelerated when, when we seriously are contemplating where we're going in this life and what happens after this life. And in that serious in that serious complication of, of life and that, and that seriously contemplating of what is ahead, we, we simply divorce ourselves from the things of uh, things that are going on in our life right now, the things of the past, and, and we really focus in on what where we're going and what's going to happen after we die. And when we're able to separate ourselves from that, then spiritual enlightenment becomes more of a reality. And that's what that book is talking about. Seriously, fellas, bottom line of this series is that I, I really believe that, that we can be renewed and, and we can be transformed by this heaven, heavenly mindedness. Is that when we focus on heaven and we think about heaven and what it's going to be like, that somewhere we're empowered to live this life very very best we can. That we're empowered to know that this life is not it. That we're simply travelers, that we're pilgrims. That this is not our home, but our home where the things we value, the things that we love the most, that's where we're destined to go. Amen? Amen. And that's the purpose of this series. Series of anyway, All that to say, Revelation chapter 21. Are you there yet? You don't have a Bible verse 20 from you. You don't have a local one? <laughs> Revelation chapter 21. Probably, when I introduced this last week, you read, I think, just the first uh, four or five verses there. We're going to really dive into this because this is the best prophetic uh, description of what is called the new heaven and the new earth. And I'll explain a little bit more about that as we was kind of coming along here. And so, uh, Revelation chapter 21, are you there yet? Okay, yeah, be there. Just we're going to look at the scripture verses here, like we did last time, and, and just kind of dive into this. And I think it's relevant. Okay, but before I tell you what's happening in Revelation 21, I need to give you some historical background of what's happening here. All of this is prophetic. This has not happened yet, but it's going to happen. Just like the flood of Noah, it happened, God told them, and just like it's going to happen now, there's going to be an end to this earth. 
And in Revelation 21, we've got to understand some of the history that's happened thus far in this prophetic word. First of all, we've got to know the history of the world is no longer in existence. This earth as we know it has melted away. It's all gone. The second thing before Revelation 21, we, the final holocaust has already occurred. That war has already been fought. You know this battle as the battle of Armageddon. Very good. You scholars out there, the battle of Armageddon has already been fought. It's already been won. Satan and all his demons have been captured and they've been put into captivity. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then second of all, we see that the hundred, the thousands, or the thousand year reign of Christ has already happened. And so we find this thing in Revelation. If you have your Bibles there, just if you kind of go back to Revelation chapter 20, if you have like a Bible like mine, they're, they're broken off in paragraphs here. And if you look at, in, uh, in verse 7 there, you see that lengthy paragraph there in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 and following. You see that, that right there, you see that Satan and all his demons have been captured. Remember, they're, they've dominated the world. They've been captured, and now they've received their final judgment, and they've been cast into uh, to the depths of Hades, into the depths of hell. And so we see the judgment of Satan. And then if you follow down that next paragraph uh, in uh, what's that, verse 15, then it says uh, about the judgment of those, of all the ages, of those who in, in Old Testament, and, and from the beginning time to New Testament, and even in present day time, that we see the final judgment. That's called the second death. Remember, death means separation. And so we see that final separation, that final death of those whose name, it says right there, those whose names are not written in the, the book of life. And they are put into eternal hell also. You, you got that? So you see, all this has happened. And so now, what's this now? What's happened so far is that God has brought His judgment, His final judgment. The earth is gone. And now, the creation and the new beginning of this new earth and this new heaven. And we began to pick this up in verse 21. Now, let me kind of explain what I, what I believe. You know, you know uh, it's just what I personally believe. Here's what I believe. I think God is, is literally going to engulf the universe at this time. In other words, the first heaven we talked about last time. Remember the first heaven? Heaven is what? The atmosphere. And the second heaven is, is the stars and the sun and the moon. And the third heaven is where right now, at this very present day, that's where God lives and, and where Christ is and those saints who have trusted Christ as the Lord and Savior and the holy angels, that's where, they, that's where their dwelling place is right now. But at this point in Revelation chapter 21, when we say the new earth and the new heaven, what we see here is, 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 is God's glory and His righteousness just explodes and just kind of infiltrates all the heavens and all the earth. And everything is transformed because of His glory and His presence and His righteousness. You can read this in 2 Peter chapter 3. And also a revelation that we see here. And so, the old heaven and the old earth that has once been marred by sin. Remember heaven? Remember Satan where he, where he rebelled against God and he was cast down? That's all changed. Then we see the earth. We know that it's marred by sin because of what? The fall of man because of my sin. <laughs> and we see the domination of, of Satan ruling over this earth. All of that is, is, is subdued under the, the feet of the footstool of God himself and of the throne. And when this happened, God's glory and his righteousness, his holiness, his purity, his explodes and just invades all of this. And, and, and no more is there any domination or suggestions of Satan and the demons or any ungodliness because God's purity rules and reigns over all this. And so now we establish this new earth and this new heaven. All right? Have we got that so far? There may be a lot of information, but just kind of, you know, know. all of that's changed, except there's one small pocket, we're going to get to that, and that small pocket is called hell, and we'll talk a little bit about it. So, with that said, this new heaven, this new earth is where God and His people will dwell in this incredible, awesome place. I like what Isaiah 65, verse 17 says, For behold, I, talking about God, for behold, God, created a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but will be, yeah, but will be in gladness and forever rejoicing in what God has created. You know what that verse really says to us? It's so forth. All this stuff that we hang on to, all these, these wonderful things about 
the creation of this world, the star, the moons, and, and, and just the beauty of this earth. This Texas alone is pretty cool, right? Yeehaw, you know? And, and all this, we are not going to really think about this much because the incredibleness and, and the beauty and the overwhelmingness of this new earth and this new heaven. This is going to be great, guys. I don't know about you, but I want to know more about that. Anybody in? Anybody want to know more about this new heaven, this new earth? So we kind of get excited about it? Kind of loosen our grip here? All right. We're going to do that. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Let's look at that first question, Joe. What does it mean, a new heaven and a new earth? So let me just kind of stop right here and kind of explain that new thing. That, that word new in the Greek is uh, uh, kaunos. Uh, and, and basically that word just simply means new. But it doesn't mean uh, new in time. But it means new in substance, new in form. It's something that is brand new. We've never seen this before. We've never experienced this. It's really different than the heaven that exists now. But it's a new heaven. It's a, it's a different form. Because, because God's glory and awesomeness and power and purity and holiness and righteousness is going to be everywhere. We don't have that right now. But it's going to be everywhere. It's going to contain this earth. It's going to surround this earth. And this whole earth will be melted away and purified this fire. Now here's the three points that I just have, real simple points. I think there's nothing elaborate about this. There's just something very, very simple about this. You know? Revelation, I personally struggle with Revelation. I don't understand about the horses and, and the dragons. And I, I really don't understand all that. But, but, but I do understand this part because uh, uh, I'm not sure why I understand this part. I just want to <laughs> Noah, that they made fun of Noah and it happened. 
you know, the scientists today just say, man, that there was a great flood, a great tragedy, you know, awesome, incredible geological thing that happened over this earth, that something happened here, and, and we call that the flood. We read that in, in, in Genesis first out. And so, so the scoffers there, and so he reminds us, those scoffers still exist today. They think, oh, this will never happen. God's not going to burn up the earth. He's going to do that. He's going to do that. You all understand that? He really is going to do this. It's going to happen. <coughs> And so, so uh, it doesn't matter what you believe it or not. It's still going to happen. And so, so these scoffers are there. And he says, notice what I said there. He said, the heaven bodies will be burned up in the salt. And the earth, in other words, all the stuff around us is just going to be gone. Do you realize that? And I know that, that kind of bothers me a little bit. Because I worked hard for some of this stuff that I have. It's just going to be gone. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, look at this building. Man, I've seen this building. We've, we've had it. We've done it. We've painted it. There's a lot, I've been a lot of sweating. It's going to go away. So, so am I the only one in the room that's been kind of feels that way? i got a question for you just a minute. Okay. So, so it kind of bothers me, you know. But, but, but anyway, it says all, all these things, all these works, all this material stuff is just going to burn it. And then that's what it says in, in, in all the, the works that are done, all the, all the things that we build up with our hands, all this stuff that's going to be done, it's going to just go away. Now, here's my point with this group. The point is this, that everything on this earth is going to melt away. And that what God says he's going to do, he's going to do. Now what does that mean to us? I mean, when, when I say that, what does that really mean to us? So we kind of quit wrestling with this ideal of stuff. It's, you know what? Every one of us in the room, we go to bed worrying about stuff. We think about it all day, back going about stuff. We, we, we obtain stuff, we get magazines about stuff, we, we worry about stuff, we worry about relationships and, and all those things, and we just, we're just consumed with all this stuff. And this. I want to tell you, one of these days, it's all going to melt away. Whatever God says He's going to do, He's going to do. Now, does that change anything? Here's the question that I have for you. Check this out. Is there anything you have right now that you would personally struggle with that God told you just to give it away? Is there anything right now that, that you have in your possessions or, you know, your security or maybe a relationship that you have right now that God says, I want you to give that away right now, that you really say, I don't think so, God. Now, you really don't mean that. You want me to be happy? This is my happiness. This is my security. I can't do that. You might get a little nervous with that question. Besides me. i got to get a word of it. You know. We just said just something very important. We just said that this earth, all this stuff, the things we worry about, the things that I struggle with this sort the things that consume my mind a lot of times, is going to dissipate. It's going to dissolve. And I just asked, what about the struggles here? It's kind of like this, this, this very wealthy man who died, and, and uh, he told his family, he his family, he said, I want, you to, I want you to get all my cash, I want you to bring it in the room. And they, did. they said, well, we, I want you to go up and I want you to put it on the roof, all my cash, put it on the roof. Because when I die, I'm going to take it with me. As I go up to heaven, I'm going to take it with me. And I'm going to take it with me. Sounds like a good plan? <laughs> Family said, you've got to be kidding me. You're not going to take that with you. Don't you know? He said, listen, I'm not dying until I get my cash in this room and I want to see it put up on the roof. They went a few days and he wasn't going to die. They thought, well, he's not going to die. We're going to have to do this thing. So, so they go and they get the cash. They brought to him. They, they said, we're going to take it on the roof. He, he has a camera up there. Family immediately, what do they do? They go up to the roof, guess what's still there? The money's still there. The wife said, See, I told you we should have put it in the basement.
these things. The second point is this. A new heaven and a new earth is an awesome upgrade. <laughs> I remember when uh, I was in seminary, I was a, I had a pain crew, and uh, on a couple occasions, I, I did receive my money. It cost me a semester of school, actually. Still upset about that. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> it was uh, four months of my life, but they didn't pay me. And, and I paid my guys, paid my money, I didn't get to go to school that semester, so I was pretty upset about that. I graduated in. I was uh, associate pastor at this church in first place. Big spring, I was there, and, and we were about to go on vacation. First time we really had a vacation, you know. By that time I had two kids, and we were going to go back to the Fort Worth Zoo and just kind of relive some of the summer days. Well, the day we were going that morning, I got a phone call. And uh, the, the person said, Are you Mr. Gary Pine? Fine Payne said, Well, I've been Fine Payne for you know, years, but he said, What do you got? And he goes, Well, I've got some money for you. I said, Really? And, uh, I said, what's up with that? Well, the liens were paid. You have a mechanics lien on that property. And so uh, they, they paid that. And we've got like $800 for you. Could you come up to Fort Worth? I said, I'll be this afternoon. <laughs> and I went and told my family. I said, hey, guys, we're not staying in Motel 6. We've been upgraded. <laughs> we're staying at the Holiday Inn with a swimming pool. You know? We got upgraded. You know? Let me tell you, heaven, man, we upgraded here. I mean, this thing is that we think it's just awesome, incredible here. It ain't nothing compared to heaven. It really isn't. And so, so what I'm trying to say to y'all is, can we just kind of loosen this grip here and kind of understand? So let's read Revelation chapter uh, 21, verses 9 through 14. Brandon, where are you? I'm going to get you to read that because I definitely need some water here. So would you read that? Now, go on, hey, y'all follow along. I'm going to probably interrupt you uh, as you read this so I kind of make some comments. Revelation 21, 9 through 14. Then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, his radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels. And on the gates the names of the twelve tribes, the sons of Israel, were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Let's go back verse 9. Notice there's a lot of wedding imagery there that we're talking about. And we kind of understand that, some of y'all understand that, that today in the New Testament when it talks about the bride of Christ. Who's the bride of Christ, church? Yeah, we are. We're the church. I gave you the answer. We're the bride of Christ. And it talks about a lot of wedding imagery. We see the finalization of this, this ceremony that we see here. And so notice here the, the, the wedding imagery that we see that, uh, that we're the bride of the church, those that are redeemed, those that are believers, those that are followers of Jesus Christ. That's the redeemed, and we're called the bride, okay? Right, just so you understand that. And notice who the husband is. The husband is the lamb, capital L, and that is who? Jesus. Oh, not Jesus, okay? And so we see a lot of wedding imagery there. That's it's a unity. That's a special relationship. That's that, that's that relationship that uh, a man and a woman share as they come together, that oneness, and, and that unity that they have, and that expression. And that's the unity that we have in heaven. There's just going to be just that, that, that connection there that we've never experienced before. And I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes. And then notice the thing in verse 10 here. Notice what it says here. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And that word from means out of God. I mean, just from, from God himself. So it's not something that he's kind of put together. It's something that, that is a part of him. That's why his presence is everywhere. We'll see that. So there's some interesting things here that I've noticed here about the, the holy city of Jerusalem. Let's look at Jerusalem. Let's speak in, in the Bible there are three Jerusalems. Okay, we've got ancient Jerusalem, the millennial Jerusalem, and then we have the eternal Jerusalem that we see here. The thing, next thing that I've noticed is the city. Now, now look up here. How many of y'all, when y'all think of heaven, you don't think of it as a city? Anybody think of it as a city? And don't cheat because I told you that kind of lie. I didn't just read that. That's what it is. No. I mean, really, in your own, 
you know, you're all thinking about heaven. What do you think heaven is? You see, countryside, all right? That old expression, you know, say, well, I may not have a mansion, but give me a shack in the back 40, that'll be good enough for me to give her things. Y'all need to get out more. But anyway, you know, this is an old expression, well, I'll probably won't make it. I'll barely make it to heaven, I'll get a shack, I'll live on the back side here. But, but when you think of heaven, do you think of the city? I've never thought of it really as a, as a city. Why? The term city is not very, it doesn't taste very good in my mind. Most of us moved from cities, didn't we? Get out of the city, right? We live in Wimberley. Why? We don't like cities. Right? I mean, most of us in this room are going to be a city, you know? You Austin folks, you know? You don't say, man, I'm not going to live in that city. You're used to a lot of you used to people. I don't blame you, you know? Wimberley. You know? And that's why that little sign on down, down the street says, Wimberley. So, so when we think of this, we think of we don't think of it as a city, but we think of countryside and rolling and openness, don't we? But here, it's going to be a city. Now, let me explain that kind of so we kind of get a grip on it. Remember, in ancient day, a city cities totally meant something different than our interpretation of city today. Back in ancient times, a city meant a place of refuge, a place of security, a place of a fortress, a place of, of protection. A city meant that you could, if, if an army was coming in, you would run to the city because they had four to five gates. It was a place of protection, of security, of friendship, of fellowship with other people, of camaraderie, of, of duty, and expression of that. It was a place of fellowship and, and, and like I said, friendship. And so a city really meant something totally different than it does to us today. A city was a good place to be in, okay? It was a good place, unlike what we may think it is today. But also... This, this word where it says, there's a term here, it's just not any city, it's Jerusalem, but it's called the Holy City. Now that's pretty interesting there. Because that's what it is. The purity, the holiness, and the righteousness of God. And those who dwell there. There's a perfected state, that may be my last point here, but there's a perfect, perfected state that's here. And it's a holy city. Now let me kind of explain something here. Because... In ancient days, often the, the name of a city was the reflection of the inhabitants of those in that city. Did y'all get that? That's a lot of words there. For example, uh, Corinth. Y'all know in the Bible there's a, there's a city called Corinth. And we get the Corinthians. That's first and second Corinthians. Well, the word uh, to Corinthicize means to sleep with the prostitute, to lie in bed with the prostitute. And so that term was given to that city because that city uh, had been very good worship and they, 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 uh, their sexual uh, indulgences, you know, prostitutes were just a common way in that city. And so that city was given that term, Corinth, Corinthians is where we get that term. Do you kind of get that? So not in heaven. Do you notice the, the terminology, the characteristic, and the name of that is describing those who are in heaven are those who are what? Say it, church. That feels good, doesn't it? Those who are holy. And so that's the description of this. Let me tell you, we may have a bad taste of that city, but let me tell you, you want to go to this city. You, you, you definitely want to go to this city. It's a, holy, it's a holy place. It's a pure place. It's God's presence is everywhere. And all those, check this out, all those who are in heaven now, get along. Even church people. <laughs> Measure 
huge cloud computing management, which is also an image management. It did the models built with Jasper, the city was very good, it very fast. And then it goes on to talk about all this other stuff here. Now, now, let me kind of break this down to you to kind of get the idea. Let me tell you how big is really big in the, first of all, there's four walls, and basically that terminology up there, just to put it in our lingo, we kind of understand this even though we really can't. First of all, I like this statement that he takes this measuring run. Do, do y'all know this is, he's going to measure 1,500 miles. That's how big we're talking about here. These walls are 1,500 miles, and every wall is 1,500 miles long. Is that big walls or long? Y'all get it? Yes. And so, so this, this, I said, Jeff Bean is, is measuring this. Can you imagine? That is a measuring a tape on steroids. You know? <laughs> I mean, that thing's going 1,500. My measuring tape goes about four feet that it just kind of droops, you know. <laughs> this measuring rod on steroids, it goes for 1,500 miles. And he's measuring this, okay? I got a point to this, okay? He's measuring this out. And he goes, so you look right there, 1,500, 1500 miles. Oh, yeah? What's that other wall? 1,500 miles. Are you kidding? And not only is it each wall that long, it's 1,500 miles tall. That's pretty tall, isn't it? And then it's, and then it's uh, two, uh, 200 feet thick. That's that wall that big. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Now check this out. Billions of people can get into this place. Would you not agree? This is big. This is big. In fact, so, so those, so that, so that, so that, so that. Look at that. That's that's over two million square miles. Is that big or not? Church, is that big or not? Yeah. It's big. Look at everything God does. He doesn't do small, right? He does big. You know, he, he does it big. And there's more to heaven than just this. This is just the city. This is just the city that, that we're going to. So that's over two million square miles in this thing. And now how is it? Check this out. It's 600,000 stories high. That's a lot of condos, isn't it? You know? <laughs> I, mean, just, I mean, that is massive stuff here. And I read all this stuff. And then I didn't put the scripture, but if you just kind of want to glance down there, look at uh, verses 19 through 20. You see a lot of jasper and gold and, and these precious stones. And there's a lot of stones that I can't even say the word. So that's why I skipped it. You know, I I'm embarrassed myself because I can't read these words. But here's the picture. It's all these precious stones and this, this gold and, and this valuable things that are all in heaven. It's in where God spares no expense. And what he's doing. First people. No expense. And, 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 it's, and, then, and then, then you see in verse 21, then you see the pearly gates. It says that the gates were made out of pearl. Can you imagine how big that orchard was to produce that? <laughs> I mean, that is a big it's, I have no doubt I said that. But anyway, it's just, it's just, you know, when you get to heaven, you can ask this. Okay, I want to see the orchard. You know, you know, God just creates this huge, that's where we get the pearly gates. If you know that's where it is. Now, here it is. Here's two points. This new heaven, this new earth is going to be incredible, guys. And, and it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be in no comparison to all the stuff we hang on to, all the stuff that we kind of think is so valuable in our life. It's, it's just not going to be worth it. But here's the question I have just as I was studying this, and I wrote this down with my side notes over here on my desk, and I wrote, why do you think God gave us these descriptions, these very detailed descriptions about this second heaven, this prophetic new heaven, this new earth. Why did he do all this detail? Why, why do you think God, God didn't do that for himself, right? You understand that? He did that for us. And, and, and why, would, why would he do that? I think it's this, for us to realize he knew that we would hang on to all this stuff that we got. And we would just try to grasp because he knows us, he knows our hearts, he knows how self-centered we are, how self-gratification we are. He knows that we would just, if we were left to ourselves, we would just get all this stuff and be happy and put it all around us and kind of support us. He knows how we respond. She said, children, what's this? Look what I've prepared for you. It's way beyond the dream. It's bigger than what you could ever imagine. 
In fact, it is so awesome and so great that you're not even going to think about those things. Those former things are just going to pass. All the stuff that, that kept you up at night and worried you and, and contained you and consumed you and, and you worked your fingers and all of that is going away. And look what I have for you now. Could you just not grasp that today? And so he writes this in detail so, so, that, so that we can understand heaven really is an upgrade. And all that seems so trivial and will become worthless. When we see what Jesus has prepared for us when we meet him. Amen? Amen. Guys, if we get this, I think it'll change our perspective. It really will. I have one more point here. The third point is this. Well, what does it mean a new heaven and a new earth? It simply means this. A new heaven and a new earth. Is eternally perfect. Eternal. Let me read this few verses to you. Or why don't you read these Which one do there? Uh, verses 22 through 25. <laughs> and I saw no temple of the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty of the land. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. In the first heaven, where the heaven is now, where are those who died in Christ today, those who died in faith in God, and the Lord. And those who are there now, the saints, those who have been martyred, we read this in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 5, those who have been martyred, those who are in the, this heaven today, and, and there's a temple there. We talked about it. There's a temple, there's a throne. Notice here, there's no more temple in the new heaven here. Because the temple represents what? The presence of God. In this new heaven, the presence of God is everywhere. Did you notice this? That he said that his radiance, his glory, is going to shine in all different directions because there's no sun, there's no moon, there's no stars. You don't need that. There's no artificial light because we've got the real light, and that is the Shekinah glory of God. His glory, his presence, his offense, his righteousness, his purity radiates everywhere. That's why there's no shadows in heaven. Amen. Amen? Amen. Remember that scripture verse? I'll just with you. I'll walk through the what? The shadow of the valley of death. Yeah, there's no shadows anymore. No more dead. We've been separated from that, okay? And so there's no shadows in heaven. Why? Because light permeates everything of His glory, of His pureness, of His righteousness. And it's everywhere. God's presence is everywhere. What does that mean for us? Maybe we're not alone anymore, right? We're not searching anymore. We found it. There's peace. There's joy. There's hope. There's security. All the things that we long for in this world. There's a satisfaction of that because His glory, His radiance, His purity is everywhere. Look at verses 23 through 25 there. Let's go back there. Yeah. There's no need of sun, no moon, no light. There's lots of nations all by that keep going. In verse 25, these gates will never be shut by day. There's no matter. The gates will never be shut by day. He can't come anymore. He's been abandoned from that place. He's no longer. He's out of authority. He's no longer has a place in there. No longer. He's been, what, cast into hell forever. He's, he's chained. No longer will He tempt you. No longer will He test you. No longer will He condemn you. No longer will He attack you and make you, you know, just, just do things that you thought, why did I do that? No more of that. It's all settled. He's cast out. There's a purity. So the gates are wide open because the enemy can't come in and rob you. No more. No more. No more. No more. So here, that's it. That's it. That's our future. That's our help. But you know me. We can't stop there. How do we take all this today? And, and how does it change me today? I got one more scripture, and that's it. I promise you that's it. So, the way I said, chapter 3. I think I have that one. That's what you're looking for. Let me read this to you. But according to his promise, the scholars. So listen, God gave us a promise, and when God gives a promise, He's going to fulfill it. Amen? And here's the fulfillment of that promise. But according to His God's promise, we are waiting for this new heaven and this new 
new earth in which righteousness dwells. Where righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and in peace. So here's what it's saying right here. Let me stop right there and read the rest of Here's what it's saying. That we're to live our life in our life. Because all that we value, all that we love, all that we treasure, all that really is for us through the followers of Christ, all that are really mean something to us right now, all the things we love, all the things we treasure, all the things we value, they're all in heaven right now. And that is our home, where our Heavenly Father is, where our Savior is, where those are beloved brothers and sisters in Christ who are right now. That's where they are now, and that's where our home is. And because of that, we're to live a life that gives an example of that life, of heaven. And then it says that we're to make, in verse 14, therefore we're to make every effort, beloved. Notice verse 17, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away by the error of the loss of people who lose your own stability. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, to Him, Lord, both now and for the day of eternity. Now check that out. Here's what, here's what Peter is saying to us today. He's saying this. We're to make every effort to live like we're already in heaven. We're to live a spotless and blameless life. And all of us have sinned. The Bible says it's all of us sin falls short of the glory of God. We got that. And so in heaven, we go, okay, we're not going to sin anymore. But here's what the Bible says. We're to live knowing that we're going to live in heaven and we're going to be spotless and blameless forever. But we're to live our life in that same fashion today. So we're not without excuse, okay? You understand that? And that's what it says here, that we're to live in light of that. And notice verse 17, I think it's interesting, be on guard. Listen, in this earth, look what's it coming up, I promise. Be on guard. In this earth, we're in a battle. We're in we're struggle. We fight. In heaven, the battle's won. There's no more struggle. There's no more fighting. But until then, we are struggling, and we are fighting, and we're in this battle. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the enemy comes, what? The gates are open on this earth, and, and the gates are open, and therefore Satan can come in, and he can rob from you. And here's what I want to say this morning, in closing. I think there are many of us in this room today that we've been robbed by Satan of the things in heaven. Simply by this, is that Satan has robbed us of our joy. He's, he's robbed us of my peace. He's robbed us of, it says there, my security of the promises of God. Is it really going to happen? Am I, am I really saved? Am I not saved? And all these, these things have been insane and robs me. But let me tell you, men, you know, if, if thieves came into your house and robbed everything, took your family, took your wife, took your children, uh, all of them, you know, and, and they took all of them. And, 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 and the police call you and say, hey, good news, we found all of them, they're safe. And, and all your possessions. I mean, what, as a man, what would you do? You'd say, hey, I get back. Would you say, you know what, you can keep some of the things. Because, Mr. Thief, you need some things. You would be still broke. So why don't you just go ahead and keep my diamond ring or, or my, my, my boat. And, um, <laughs> Is there a man on the face of the earth that would say that? <laughs> no, no, we would Why? We want it all back. We say, our Heavenly Father, and He comes back. And He comes to this earth, He takes it all back. You all see that? Yeah. It all belongs to Him, and He takes it back. But some of us today, we're not living with this heavenly perspective. And we just allow Satan just to rob us of our joy, rob us of our peace, rob us of our health. And, and, and we just said, well, I guess that's the problem. It's not. So, so what I want to do, I want to pray as we close. That we can have a heavenly perspective. And that we don't just have to say, well, one day, one day, one day, we can live it now. I mean, y'all, some of y'all can just choose to do that. We can say, well, I'll just, I'll just wait for heaven. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be angry. I'm not going to have peace. I'm not going to have joy. I'm not going to have that. And when I get to heaven, I'll get it all. You can do it if you want to. You have a chance. Not me. I want everything God has for me today. Amen? Amen. And that means Jesus said, I came to give you life. I came to give you what? Uh, just a taste of heaven. Right. Let's pray. 
Ask this question. Two things. Heads or First question is this. We'll go back to that question a long time ago. Is there anything that you're just really holding on to that you'd really struggle with God said today? Give it up. Would you just say, Lord, you can take that. You can take whatever you want from it. Everything belongs to you anyway. Besides that, I've got this new place I'm headed to. That way overshadows this stuff. Second, do you really feel that Satan has robbed you some joy today, some peace? That security that comes through Christ and through Him alone. Think for a moment. I want to pray for you. That the enemy would be bound off your life. That the Lord will restore to you that joy that He wants you to have. Now that doesn't mean an absence of struggling in this life, church. Misunderstand. Because that's the way life is. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a war. There's going to be tests. There's going to be trials. That's the way it is. But you don't need to lose your joy and your peace and your security in Jesus. So have you lost your joy and peace this morning? Let me pray for you. Lord, you know those that are crying out to you right now. Binding me off in the name of Jesus. Lord, you say the things on this earth to be done is the things that are done in heaven. And you give us fulfillment, peace, and joy, and security in heaven. And Lord, you said, as you taught us to pray, that your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. So we just believe that today. And I pray for those that have lost their joy and lost their peace today, that you would restore that back to them so that they can continue to live a life that is heavenly minded. Or change our hearts so we just loosen up our grip here and trust you more. Help us each day just to rejoice with the challenge that has been given to, to us. That each day we would rejoice that we're one day closer to heaven because of your grace. Through Christ and through Christ alone, through faith. That gift of salvation. Help us to be reminded of that. And to live a life that is spotless and blameless, pleasing to you until you come for us. Until we draw our last breath. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.